Do you ever start something and think to yourself that this is going to be really easy and take no time at all? Yeah, this was one of those projects, and man, was I wrong. Over the last three years of my woodworking journey, I've encountered tons of different projects. Coffee tables, dining tables, workbenches, renovation projects, cabinets, shop projects, and many, many more. Whenever I start out a new build, I feel like I have a pretty good grasp on if it's going to be fast or take a long time, if it's going to be easy or really challenging, and if I have all the tools and skills to accomplish something, or if it's going to require me to come up with a lot of creative solutions. This particular project, I went into thinking that I could knock it out in a few days, it would all be fairly simple, and that I really wouldn't have any roadblocks or stumbling points. And all of that was true until I reached this point here. Working out of a small garage in my apartment comes with many, many challenges. Almost all of my tools, like the flip top tool cart, have to be wheeled out every time I want to use them. And you might also notice that I don't own a joiner. That's because I haven't found one that seems worth spending the money on when I'm stuck with a single 15 amp, 110 volt circuit in my garage with no access to the breaker panel to upgrade the electrical. Sure, I could go with one of those cheap benchtop joiners, but I've tried them in the past and I really wasn't happy with the results that I would get unless I was working with super short boards like a cutting board. For furniture, not so much. No worries though, I can simulate what a joiner does by using this planer sled. And I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty details about this right now because I've already made a full video about it in the past which I'll link in the description below for you to check out. I will 100% admit it, while this method does in fact work, and works pretty darn well, it takes absolutely forever to flatten one face on every single board. You have to hot glue one board down to the sled, wait for that glue to harden, run it through the planer, scrape off the hot glue, and repeat for every single board. It's not fast, but man, it'll certainly make me appreciate getting a joiner once I move out of this shop. As you can tell, I've got a million different boards to mill down for this project, and to prevent myself from blowing the electrical breaker, I can only remove about 1 64th of an inch. Uh, uh, looks like that's about 0.3 of a millimeter on each pass, so this takes a long time. But I am not going to make you watch all of that. With the boards milled on both sides, I also need to get a straight, clean edge on the boards. I've shown how to do this on a router table in the past, but I honestly find that a track saw tends to be faster and easier. This Craig track saw quickly and easily rips a perfectly straight edge on all of my boards, allowing me to take them over to the table saw and then rip off that last edge to get perfectly milled wood. Is this the fastest and most efficient way to mill lumber? Absolutely not. But I know the majority of people watching this don't have a dream shop with massive joiners and planers, so hopefully these struggles resonate with you. Anyway, with the boards milled, I can start gluing up some panels. I am not going to be using any alignment aids like dowels, dominoes, or biscuits because I don't want to accidentally cut into them later on in the project. But one tip I will give you to ensure that your boards stay coplanar with each other is to use some clamps right on the seams of the boards at the end. This will help pull things together and prevent large bumps between the boards, which are difficult to clean up afterwards. Speaking of clamps, gluing up tons of large panels is where you will quickly find yourself running through clamps really, really fast. You know what they say though, you can never have enough woodworkers telling you that you can never have enough clamps. So I got all the panels out of clamps after that glue set up for just a couple hours. However, there's something closer that I wanna show you. Whenever you're making a project completely out of solid hardwood, you're not always gonna get perfect boards. 
you're probably going to run into problem areas like voids here and here. And my favorite way to stabilize and fill those voids is with a little bit of epoxy, but none of that neon crap. Before all of you woodworkers turn off the video because I'm bringing out epoxy, I promise that I am not throwing any of those awful neon sparkly colors in here. These large voids go all the way through the panels, so I need a way to fill and stabilize them in a discreet way. I'll first cover one side of the void with just some regular cheap packing tape to prevent the epoxy pouring through the other side since this stuff is really tough and waterproof. After flipping the panel over, I take some hot glue and make a sort of dam around all the voids. The purpose of this, which you'll see in a few clips, is to prevent the epoxy from pouring all over the panel, making a massive mess to clean up later. This dam contains all the epoxy in one single spot, which also helps me save money on epoxy, and that is a win-win in my book. My epoxy of choice is this Total Boat High Performance stuff with their slow hardener. I am an engineer in my day job, so I like to do as little complex math as possible when I'm out here in the garage. These pre-measured pumps make sure that I don't have to calculate any complex ratios, just one pump of resin and one pump of hardener, it's easy. And to make this epoxy as unobtrusive as possible, I use just a tiny dab of their black pigment to make it jet black. As you can see, the hot glue dam makes this super messy process of pouring epoxy substantially easier. Epoxy does take a little bit of time to seep into all the voids, so by pouring excess on the top, it'll basically self-feed itself if there are voids that I can't see below the surface of the wood. Now even with the slower hardener, there are sometimes small bubbles present, but a quick blast with a heat gun gets rid of those no problem. And just like that, welcome to Ohio, where last night when I poured this epoxy, it was 70 degrees, and this morning, it's 30 degrees out. Which is why now I'm wearing a winter coat. But right now, let's remove that hot glue and then take that extra epoxy off these boards. The hot glue can sometimes be a little bit difficult to remove, but I use my finest, most expensive Harbor Freight chisel to work my way through that to remove as much as I can. To remove all that extra epoxy, I typically would just grab my sander and remove that stuff in a couple seconds. But a bunch of angry YouTube commenters always get mad that I don't use hand tools. So, look what I got. I got a block plane, and I'm gonna try using this. Dare I? <laughs> you know what, I'm going to. See if it works. I will be the first one to tell you that I am pretty new to using hand tools, but I had Jonathan Katz Moses on my podcast, Off The Cut, recently, and he taught me everything that I need to know about them from setup to sharpening, and I feel like I've gotten well past the beginner stage. Off The Cut podcast is available on all streaming platforms, and I'll leave a link to it down in the description below. Oh my gosh, I'm sweating, I gotta take this off. This is way too much work. I honestly was pretty intimidated getting into hand tools, which is why I never really gave them a chance. All right, I give up. While this does work, and yes, it is ridiculously sharp, I was getting paper thin shavings on wood. This is taking forever on epoxy, so I'm going back to my sander. But I will admit it, I've tested this block plane out on a few things off camera, and it is definitely going to be making a full-time appearance in videos moving forward. I am far from a pro when it comes to hand tools or epoxy, so maybe the two just don't work well together. Yep, just what I thought. <laughs> this is much easier. And I think that's what woodworking and making things is all about. If you have an idea, don't be afraid to just give it a try. On the bottom side of the board, you can see how the packing tape kept all the epoxy from leaking out, and it's still pretty easy to remove, unlike if you use something like duct tape that I see a lot of other creators use. And I just realized that we're like 10 minutes into the build video, 
and you still don't even know what I'm building. So let's jump into SketchUp to take a closer look and clear things up. So this is a rendering of what the client wants me to build for them. Can you guess what it is? No? All right, what about if I give you a category of food and drink? No? Still can't guess? All right, it's a wine rack. The client wants the wine rack to sit in the corner of a room and hold about 30 bottles of wine. Seems a little excessive to me, but hey, I'm not here to judge. The construction seems pretty simple. There are seven panels and four outer side support things. Where things get a little tricky is that each shelf has this large sweeping curve on it, which isn't horribly difficult, but each shelf also has these grooves to house a bottle of wine so that it doesn't roll side to side and fall on the ground. This is going to be a little bit challenging to do by hand, but I'll get to that part later. Now that you have a better idea of what I'm actually building, let's jump back into the garage. So those larger panels that I made need to be broken down into some more manageable pieces to create each individual shelf. The Craig ACS table is new to me, but it has made cutting large panels down at a perfect 90 super simple. I would typically do this on my crosscut sled on my table saw, but my sled is not large enough to safely do 22 inch wide panels, but this setup here makes it effortless. And the other cool thing is that since it's got these little nifty stops here, I can set them to exactly 22 inches to get a perfectly cut square panel. And there you have it, all of the rough size shelf panels. That was kind of tough to say. Since these panels are gonna have curves like this, it's going to be a little bit difficult to make sure that they are all the exact same shape. So what I'm gonna do, and maybe it's a process you've seen me do in the past, is I'm gonna make a simple template. Well, <laughs> at least it seems simple in my head before I started. I like to make all of my templates out of MDF, but the only sheet that I had on hand large enough was a leftover cutoff from my workbench that's covered in laminate. But that shouldn't be an issue. And before I get too far into the build, I should let you know that this video is not sponsored by some hair loss company, a disgusting green shake, or an antivirus service. So don't worry about me blowing you up with an obnoxious three minute long ad read. Instead, just know that Craig wanted to support my channel and all of you viewers by providing you with free plans to build this wine rack for yourself that I'll leave down in the description below. Those plans will give you all the dimensions that you need and have all the complicated math for the template already worked out for you. With the template trimmed down to size and all of the crazy layout lines marked, I whipped up the circle cutting jig that's really just a nail hammered into the template to guide my router on a perfect arc. Honestly though, I would absolutely just spend the money to buy a pre-made version of this next time I need to make a circle because micro adjusting this thing was next to impossible. Another tip, take fairly shallow passes when you're doing this with the router for a much cleaner and safer cut. I don't need to get anywhere near all the way through because it's much faster for me to grab my jigsaw and rough cut inside the groove that I made to remove all of the excess. Just make sure that you stay about 1 8th of an inch away from the inside of the curve. Oh, and watch out for your toes. To clean the rest of the template up, I chucked up a flush trim bit in my homemade router table. Which, by the way, there is a full video and free plans on how I made that, which I'll link in the description too. It's super easy to make. And for everyone asking what I ended up doing for my router table fence, I just clamped on some scrap pieces of MDF to my table saw fence. It's not pretty, but honestly, it works great. The flush trim bit removes all of the excess MDF from the template, leaving a perfect match of the curve above. And with that outside curve complete, here comes the challenging part. I need to somehow accurately cut out all of the grooves for the wine bottles to rest in. I whipped up another template. Whoa, 
It's like template in template inception. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the twilight zone. And put some double-sided tape down to keep this thing secure. I thought this would be a funny clip, but now that I'm looking at it, it's just kind of awkward. Anyway, the secondary template gets stuck down exactly where I drew out the marks for those cutouts. I chucked up a small templating bit in my router to follow the shape of the secondary template to transfer onto my primary template. And I know, I know, it seems confusing, but just stay with me for a minute. After routing that shape out, I can pop off the guide to reveal that perfect cutout. I'll continue to do the exact same thing moving across the primary template to make all those grooves, but if you've been paying close attention, you might have noticed that the template now magically is a lot thicker. That's because the router bit that I ordered to make the rounded grooves in the panel for the wine bottles showed up and was a lot larger than I expected. It might not make sense now, but it'll be clearer once I get to that step. One word of caution is that when you are routing out MDF like this, you absolutely need a respirator on because it makes an absolute nightmare of a mess. Super fine dust is all over the place and you do not want to be breathing this crap in. I really do like this router. In fact, I have two of them, one here and the other in my table saw router lift. But this is one of those times where I really wish this router had built-in dust collection like those Festool routers because this was a ridiculous mess. After this whole process, I had to grab a leaf blower and blow all of this crap out of my shop. So MDF, I appreciate what you do for us woodworkers, but you make a horrible mess. I didn't think it was really necessary to show you all of the routing footage, but I slowly worked my way routing those grooves all the way through the template until it looked like this. Now, thankfully, this template is finally done. Now, it probably didn't seem like it in the video, but this literally took me over six hours to make just the template. And that is 100% the reason why I really, really wanna get a CNC in the shop, but I do wanna show you that you can make templates by hand without a CNC. It just takes absolutely forever. With the template finalized, I can now start the process of transferring the shape to all of my individual shelves. To help align the template consistently, I attach some of these scraps to the side that will allow me to match up the corners perfectly before tracing out the outline of the final curve that I want. Instead of hogging out all of that material with a router bit, it'll make my life easier by removing as much as possible with my jigsaw. When doing this, again, I try to stay about one eighth of an inch away from that line, just in case I get any blade deflection, and again, watch out for those toes. But to make it even easier, a bandsaw, even my little tykes one, can rip through this task substantially faster if you have access to one. Again, just stay slightly proud of that line that you marked out earlier. I think it's important to share multiple ways to do things because too often I see comments on videos where people say that they can't build a certain project because they don't have this super specific nuanced tool. And that is absolutely not true. There is always another way or workaround to just about every single task in the workshop. You just gotta get creative and use what you have. With those curves roughed out, I can focus my attention on refining all of the shelves by transferring the finalized template shape. A little bit of double-sided tape will quickly and securely hold the template to the shelf and those registration blocks ensure that I get perfect alignment every time. I'll start off by flush trimming the curve to match the template shape perfectly. 
Since the wood grain is going in multiple directions here, I highly suggest trying out a compression spiral bit instead of one of those regular straight flush trim bits. It'll give you a much cleaner result. With that curve done, I brought the piece over to my workbench and set it on these Craig project blocks that grip really well for tasks like this. In my router, I've got a pattern bowl bit that I talked about earlier that I can plunge in about one eighth of an inch and follow the outline of my template. Again, this was super, super time consuming and messy, but hey, I made it work with the tools that I've got. Oh my gosh, felt like it took an absolute eternity to get all these pieces templated out. But reminder, because the top is not going to be holding any wine bottles, you should have not templated out any spots other than just the curve on this piece. But before we can go any further, I'm going to set these aside and grab some more oak and rip down some strips that are gonna make the, I guess, sides of this wine rack. I know what you're thinking. Oh. Hey there. Uh, I know what you're thinking. Eric, why in the world are you using red oak? It's hideous. I 100% agree. But the client wants it to match some of their existing furniture and home decor. So unfortunately, that's what I'm going with here. And they also want me to violate one of my morals, but we will cover that later on in the video. With four of those pieces cut down, I can grab two of them that are going to be in the back corner against the wall. In order for those pieces to meet up nicely in the corner, I'm going to rip a 45 degree bevel on each piece. Whenever I do bevel cuts, I strongly recommend using a feather board to get consistent pressure alongside the fence. And since I don't own a miter saw station, I just clamp all of the pieces together and trim them down all at once with my miter gauge. Now that I finally have everything cut down, it's time to start assembling things. So I need to attach all these side pieces to... All of these shelves. And to connect those pieces together, you could use really whatever you want. You could use dowels, you could use biscuits, you could use pocket holes, you could use screws. But to make this fast and easy for me so I can get this video done and move on to the next one, I'm just gonna use my domino. Oh my no, God! No, God, please, no! 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 And I know, I know, Eric, I don't have a domino. And you do not need one to build this. There are tons of other cheaper alternatives that will work just as well, but I've got to get this build video done, so that's what I'm going to be using. To get these shelves lined up along this line, all I need to do is fold the shelf down, plunge the domino vertically to create a mortise on the side support, and then I can plunge the domino horizontally to create the mortise in the shelf. Doing it this way doesn't require any complex math to calculate offsets and all kinds of hard stuff like that. It just gives you perfect alignment every time. This exact same method would work with biscuits, dowels, those uh, beadlock things, or you can just use some screws driven from the outside because remember, this is going to be in a corner so no one will ever see those screws. So now I've finally got all the joinery cut on every single piece. And truly, I thought that using the domino was gonna make this really fast, but I have to admit, it took forever to do this. Something like pocket holes or just driving screws through the backside probably would be a heck of a lot faster. But because a lot of the edges on these pieces are super sharp, let's take these over to the router table and put a nice round over on them. Edge profiles are the perfect place to really customize the look of your piece. You can do something like a roundover, chamfer, Roman OG. Uh, no, don't use Roman OG. <laughs> that one is hideous. 
but any other edge profile can really make your design pop. I'm using a quarter inch roundover bit here to really soften the edges and prevent chipping when heavy wine bottles are placed on the rack. You can already see what a difference the edge profile makes in the look of each individual part. With all the side supports rounded over, I'll also round over the front curved edge of each shelf. And after a little bit of goofing off, it's time for the stressful part, the glue up. I'm going to be gluing the two outside pieces that were ripped at a 45 degree angle together first. Whenever doing large glue ups like this wine rack, you really need to take your time and separate it into multiple glue ups to make things way easier on yourself. And those clamping blocks that I made in a video a really long time ago make clamping up 45 degree angles effortless. I'll link to that video down in the description too. The next glue up is putting each shelf into that corner piece. I highly recommend using some sort of clamping squares like these ones to make sure that your pieces are going in at a perfect 90. And yes, I know they're expensive, but there's something I literally use every single week in the shop. A little bit more clamping pressure and hold on folks, elbow cam incoming, nice. Each individual shelf can be popped into place and clamped separately, resulting in a stress-free glue up. <laughs> hey -o, get it out. And the shelves can be left to sit for a couple hours while the glue sets up. Again, this is one of those times where you end up going through clamps really fast, so make sure that you have enough on hand. And remember, you can never have enough woodworkers telling you that you can never have enough clamps. After all the shelves are in place in that corner bracket, I attached one of the side shelves. Getting all seven of those dominoes to line up perfectly was a bit of a struggle as you can see, which is why I told you to do these glue ups separately from one another so the glue doesn't dry before you're finished. Again, those clamping blocks that I made a long time ago come in handy because there was no way I could clamp these pieces together without them. Once the glue cured on that side, I could rotate things and struggle again to pop on that other side support. And the next day I could come back and do a little bit of last minute sanding. Real quick, if you made it this far in the video, leave a comment down below that says nachos. Writing the word nachos lets me know that you actually watched the video and is a huge, huge help and help growing my channel and getting this out to more people. So if you would like to help me out, just start your question or comment off with the word nachos. And if you'd like to support my channel even more, consider picking up something from my online store like a hat, t-shirt, or plans for tons of different woodworking projects. All right, let's get back to the video. These edges were not rounded over by the router because they would have resulted in these really weird joints where the pieces met together, so I just took care of them by hand. <sighs> As I was sanding this thing, I realized that I made a big mistake. Can you see what it is yet? No? Well, if you put any weight on this, it wants to immediately fall forward. So what I need to do is cut down a little block or something that'll go underneath here just to keep this from falling over. See, I make mistakes too. <laughs> Honestly, I, I should have seen that coming from the beginning. Because this is solid oak, this thing weighs a lot. Once it's loaded up with bottles of wine, there is going to be weight wanting to tip it forward, so that bottom support is definitely necessary. Just a few dominoes and some glue will hold that piece on perfectly, and then it's time for some finish. So with all of that finishing sanding done, you might have remembered how earlier in the video I said that this project compromised my morals. And what do I mean by that? So I'm of the opinion that I think wood always looks better when it's left in its natural state, just add a little bit of oil or polyurethane or whatever finish on top of it that you want and leave it there. If you want a dark color, use a dark wood. If you want a light color, use a light wood. 
But since this piece is not for me and it's going at a client's home, they wanted it a specific color. And unfortunately for me, that means that I have to stain this thing. This is walnut stain, which looks absolutely nothing like walnut. I think stain makes wood look awful, but hey, it's not always my opinions that matter. But as my friend Tripp says, wood stain is a lie. And after the stain on this dried for a couple days, I put on a coat of hard wax oil. And because I don't own 30 bottles of wine, I don't really have any way to stage this for some beauty shots. So I'll just stop here and I'll see you on the next one.